Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Momentum. Why don't we stand together? Let's worship our God who provides for us. Let's sing it out. This dry and desert land, I can tell myself, keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, the water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me on. Let it flow, let it flow, yeah. A well that never will run dry I rambled on my own Never believing I would find An everlasting stream Your river carries me home Let it flow, let it flow God, you are so good to us. We lift our voices to you. We give our hearts to you. 
accept our worship this morning. Let's sing it. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're alive, but I singing everybody you can have a seat
morning, church. It's a great time to be a Bible-believing Christian, as always. But especially today, as we have more scientific evidence which confirms what Scripture has to say. But I want to start out today talking about more about the past and the foundation of our nation. So we'll answer the question, is Genesis relevant in America today? But I have this thing that it's, I think is a little bit cute here. It says, in the beginning, the universe was created. This made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. <laughs> okay. But look carefully at the screen and you're going to see a slight change. In the beginning, the universe was created. This made a lot of people very angry, and this has been widely regarded as a bad movie. <laughs> All right, well, that, that depends on the point of view as to whether or not you accept what the truth of Scripture is and want to follow the Lord and his teachings, or whether you choose to reject it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and in the beginning is what started time. God is in the plural, Elohim, uh, the Trinity was present. Created, the verb bara is applicable only to God because he spoke into existence the matter and energy, everything in the universe by the power of his word. That verb cannot apply to people. When we create something, all we do is... Heaven refers to space, not the stars yet, because that was day four. And then the earth refers to not the planet yet because it took three days for him to refine it, but the matter, the atoms, the elements, the periodic table, you could say. So in this verse, we have the three components of the physical universe, time, space, and matter. I'll bet you didn't realize that before, but that's all packed into that verse. So we have this foundation here, such as in John 1.3, the confirmation of this. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. And Revelation 4.11, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So when people want to monkey, monkey around, to, to make a bad pun, with what is in that first chapter of Genesis, they also have to deal with the rest of Scripture and the confirmation and other portions of Scripture that go back to Genesis. So a history lesson here, was the Bible important in the making of America? So we have these in our documents. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So that's in our Declaration of Independence. And out of this comes four foundational truths. One is the Founding Fathers believed in a creator, God. They believed that all men were created equal. They believed our rights come from God, not from government. And today we need to really remember that our rights come from God. Now, the government's task is to preserve and protect those God-given rights of God-given man. It's very important because we see a lot of stuff happening today that is not consistent with what you read right here. The educational heritage, the laws and statutes of Harvard College in 1643 stated, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Now, when you think of Harvard today, it seems like they've strayed just a tiny bit from this, wouldn't you say? In 1691, the College of William and Mary Charter stated that the Church of Virginia may be furnished with a seminary of ministers of the gospel. In 1701, Yale College was founded to train ministers. The first president of Princeton stated, Cursed be all that learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. So when you look at what's coming out of these institutions today, you can see that they've pretty much done 180 degrees here, turning away from the truth of Scripture and uh, teach many things that are very antithetical to Scripture. The original public school system in America, when first introduced by Daniel and Noah Webster, provided students with a firm biblical foundation. The first textbook printed in America was used to teach reading and Bible lessons. 
Isn't that amazing? Reading and Bible lessons in the public schools. The McGuffey readers, the children modeled in the books were prompt, good, kind, honest, and truthful. They taught students biblical morals. Uh, it doesn't seem to be what's going on in our schools today. Uh, as you read what's going on and the headlines of all this stuff with critical race theory and all these other things, gender confusion. 120 million copies of McGuffey's readers were sold. Get this, and this is amazing, between 1836 and even as late as 1960. So for uh, over, what, 124 years, those things were used in our schools. They were a firm foundation in our schools for that biblical world view. In 1865, Congress approved the motto, In God We Trust, for our coins, which is still there. The words, In God We Trust, are inscribed in the House and Senate chambers. They're literally chiseled into the marble in those chambers. On the walls of the Capitol Dome appear the words, The New Testament according to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Liberty Bell is inscribed with Leviticus 25.10. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And on the metal cap of the Washington Monument are the words Laos Deo, which translate to praise be to God. Just think of this. In all, of these, all of these monuments, all of these buildings, this stuff is literally in stone or in metal in our public buildings. In the Lincoln Memorial are the words God, Bible, the Almighty, and divine attributes. And the Jefferson Memorial includes the words God who gave us life and gave us liberty. So here we have a flag with, uh, placed on it, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Those words under God were added in 1954. I don't know if you realize that. They weren't always there. So and when you look at what's going on today, we see tremendous difference in, from that foundation, from that heritage of our founding fathers. So this new foundation that we have is built on these uh, propaganda machines for evolution, uh, National Geographic, Time Magazine, uh, Discovery Channel, uh, various publications, and of course this iconic uh, supposed change from uh, chimp to uh, man. And so we have this doctrine of atheistic evolution replacing the belief in God as creator. So in our, our public schools, state schools, disallow the singing of Christmas carols. I'm ancient enough to have been in a situation when I was in grade school, we actually sang Christian Christmas carols in school and even some of them in Latin. It just, and, and this was in a public school here, here in the valley. Uh, disallowing prayer. I remember we even had prayer at the beginning of each school day when I was in grade school. Disallowing the posting of the Ten Commandments, whether it be in schools or in our, even our courthouses these days. Disallow the name of Jesus at athletic events or school assemblies, but you know we still have students who are bold enough to initiate that at football games. I'm glad that those those children are so well founded. And disallow the teaching of a Creator God. Yet you know all this talk about separation of church and state, but our public schools are tax supported, and they teach religion. They teach the religion of evolution, the religion of evolution. It's a tax payer supported mandated religion being taught in our public schools. So there is no separation of church and state. You have to think about that one. So as a result of this, marriage is under assault. And that is my beautiful bride there. The value of human life is under assault. Uh, with uh, abortion, uh, this business of euthanasia. Children are under assault. Uh, all the stuff going on with confusing them about who they are. Uh, education in the Bible is under assault. Uh, 
And that's my second born, my daughter there, when she graduated uh, from college. So we have a tremendous contrast between the foundation of our nation and what's going on now. So sexual purity has become sexual freedom from constraints to do anything you want. Academic freedom has become state mandated training. And it's really indoctrination, it's not education. And it's, there's just been too much of, of propaganda being given to our students and then they get to uh, regurgitate what has been spoon-fed to them. And so they talk about tolerance, and that's fine if you tolerate them, but if you have a different opinion, they don't tolerate you. So this business of tolerance is a one-way street. Freedom to live has become freedom to choose who dies. As I mentioned, abortion, abortion euthanasia, physician assisted suicide, and it's become legal in more and more states as time goes on. Absolute morality has become moral relevance. Oh, well, what's true for you is fine, but it's not true for me. And so that's fine. You can believe what you want to believe, but I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And so there is no absolute truth. It's been done away with. And of course, scripture is full of absolute truth. And an interesting uh, parallel to bring up to someone who says that is, okay, so are you telling me that spiritual laws change from one place to another or from one location to another, just like physical laws change? And then you get them to realize the physical laws don't change from one place to another. They're the same under the, the same conditions. And biblical principles have been deemed intolerant. So it's, again, it's that business of, well, I'll tolerate what I want, but not what, what you may think, which is different. So, God's word is the foundation for this biblical worldview with laws, standards, marriage, and the meaning of life. But when evolution is inserted as the new foundation, then it becomes a different thing, such as man's opinion is inserted instead. Or we can have homosexual behavior, gay marriages now. Uh, just because something is made legal by the Supreme Court doesn't mean that it's right. We have to keep that in mind. Being legal is not necessarily being correct. <clears throat> so now we have that. <clears throat> Standards are replaced again by man's opinion so that whatever you want goes. And the meaning of life has been uh, cheapened tremendously by abortion and uh, these other problems such as late term abortion even now in certain places, they say, oh, yeah, we can abort someone up to the actual time of delivery. It's just astounding I don't know how people can somehow in their brain justify that and live with that. Well, um, being a U of A grad, I like to take any opportunity I can to diss ASU. <laughs> and. They had on faculty until a couple of years ago a fellow named Lawrence Krauss, a physicist, and uh, his great talent was being able to write on a clear board facing the audience the word nothing backwards to him as he wrote it, but so they could read it in the normal fashion. And he, uh, his thing was to be able to explain how the universe came to being from nothing apart from God. And so he replaced, in the beginning, God created with, in the beginning, nothing created. And he wrote this book, A Universe from Nothing. And so he got a lot of notoriety and publicity uh, for a period of time. Uh, however, uh, other secular physicists, after they read it, uh, panned the thing, saying this is ridiculous, it's, there's no basis for this. But this is the kind of stuff that is being promulgated in the uh, schools, especially the state-supported schools, but not only the state-supported schools. This is a page out of the uh, one of the standard college biology textbooks, Campbell's Biology, which we actually use at Arizona Christian University, and it doesn't bother me at all about all the different times it talks about evolution because I just simply use those as opportunities to say this is what real science has to say about this and to point out how the thing, points in the textbook are, are actually anti-science. 
So that's fine. It's a good way to use those textbooks. And so here's the one of the latest editions of it. It's in its 12th edition now. And I'd love to compare what's in each edition as they keep having to take some stuff out because it's been so disproven that they finally have to realize, okay, we really got to get rid of this uh, stuff. But it's not only from the secular world that we have these uh, problems and issues. We also have people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians uh, within the church at large who think that they are helping God by explaining how God used evolution. So we have this kind of a problem as well. Hugh Ross, pictured here, originally uh, from Canada, an astronomer based in California now, uh, is, uh, has this ministry, uh, Reasons to Believe, and it's all about explaining how God used evolution. And so his personal wisdom is being used to replace God's wisdom. So I'm going to read to you an excerpt from some of what he has written. And he wrote, Starting about two to four million years ago, God began creating man-like mammals or hominids. I put began creating in green as to mean, indicate that this is the tense, the simple uh, tense used as if it were observed history, as if this were eyewitness, and of course he wasn't an eyewitness. Uh, he doesn't look like he's quite two to four million years old. And so uh, this is his inserting his thought into here and stating it as if it were a fact, but it's his opinion. These creatures stood on two feet, had large brains that used tools. Some even buried their dead and painted on cave walls. However, they are different from us. They did not worship God or establish religious practices. Well, how does he know this? Was he there? Job 38.4. In time, all these man-like creatures went extinct. Then, about 10 to 25,000 years ago, God replaced them with Adam and Eve. So how does he know this? The green, again, is, is this business indicating verbs that make evolution happen. Magic verbs, magic words that make it happen, at least in their mind. And in the a uh, more purplish color there is to indicate uh, very vague things um, that are very uh, proximate, uh, indistinct, fuzzy phrases, fuzzy phrases, which are not able to be pinned down. So this is the kind of stuff that is in the textbooks, which has been replacing the history that we have in Scripture. So evolution has taken over our society, so our education system really is the battleground here. Um, so there, and not only the education system, but the media as well, and the church itself. So much of the church at large has been neutralized or captured by these folks who have the evolutionary f frame of mind. So we are in a war, and there really is no safe place to hide. And we don't want to hide, we need not to hide. We need to be in the battle. We need to be taking this truth out into the public place and simply share simple things. Some of the simple things I gave to you last week or this coming uh, weeks, uh, now that you have to remember everything, but enough to try and trigger someone to start actually thinking. What a concept. So this is a war, spiritual warfare. So in our educational systems, we have non-believers educating non-believers, and we have non-believers educating Christians to believe like non-believers, and in our universities, we have professors who make it their passion to ridicule, isolate, and uh, dehumanize students who dare speak out with a biblical framework, and they come under attack and unfortunately, uh, the attack is so vicious that a fair number of these students finally give way. Uh, it's very difficult, and I see some students shaking their heads, yes, here. Yeah, they've been through that. And then we have Christians educating Christians to believe like non-believers because they're compromised. Well, how in the world did this happen? Well, Charles Darwin laid the foundation. Now, he's not the only guy who got evolution going in the more modern times, but he got the press. He gets the main credit, but there are plenty of others who actually laid foundation for him. He actually stole some of his stuff from his own grandfather. So there were others, but he's the, he's the poster child. John Dewey, an American uh, who 
was very prolific in speaking and writing in the, uh, especially in the 1930s onward. Uh, spoke so much and uh, wrote so much that he became uh, appointed at Columbia University as a professor there. And so he started indoctrinating his students, replicating himself, replicating his worldview, his way of looking at things. And here's one of his quotes. There is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the groups of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, the immutable truth is also dead and buried. In other words, no absolute truth. No room for fixed natural laws or moral absolutes. So what he's saying is everything goes. So he started indoctrinating his students at Columbia University, and then in turn, they indoctrinated their students, and they multiplied themselves through the academic generations and took over the public school system by 1960. This is how this came about. So there's decades of systematic teaching that there is no God, there are no moral absolutes, we are the product of evolution, no clear meaning to life, and there's no absolute truth. And what's really sad is when you are taught there is no clear meaning to life, where do you, why exist? I mean, where, where is the hope? Where is the future? You know, because as I mentioned last, last week, the only thing evolution has to offer is death and darkness. No life, no light. It's uh, crystal clear, the, the difference, the division. So, how can students maintain a biblical worldview against such attacks if they are not equipped? So, we have too many pastors in the pulpit saying God used evolution. So, students are trained to compromise. So, seminary students are also trained to compromise. That's why I have so many pastors in pulpits who have thrown away the absolute truth in scripture and have adopted these compromised situations. So we end up with things like this. The fountains, for the love of Darwin, February 14th is not just Valentine's Day, it's Evolution Sunday because of Darwin's birthday. So here you have churches that are teaching, promulgating, promoting Darwin in Sunday morning services. So as I said last week, you guys are so blessed to have a pastor here who gets it, who understands, and he's in the great minority. And uh, you are so blessed to have that. So in their little uh, inside inserts, religious people from many diverse faith traditions and locations around the world understand that evolution is quite simply sound science. It's like the today with this COVID stuff, follow the science. Well, they're not. <laughs> they're not following the science. Uh, so th this is, reminds me of uh, 1984, new speak. Okay, that, that's what's going on. If God used evolution, we lose the meaning of the word day, and we talked about that last week. The order of created things, because the order of the history given us in Genesis 1 is totally different than the order of the evolutionary scenario, and I choose the word scenario, it's a piece of fiction, like a stage play. The flood is replaced by a local flood in their mind. In uh, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment, there is confirmation that God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them in six days, and then gives the command to rest on the seventh day and keep it holy. He's not talking about working six long age, ages, long uh, periods of time, and then resting one long period of time. That's not humanly possible. And he's not writing the note to himself. Memo to self, work six, rest one, long age. Right? So you have to really just obliterate scripture to adopt this way of looking at things. Okay, Christ himself is confirming in Mark 10, 6, in the beginning, uh, he created them male and female, not after some long period of time of evolution. And then it's these three verses I started out with, again, created all things. But then in chapter 3, we had Satan come along and 
do his thing, and then in Second Corinthians uh, from chapter 11, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And we have a happy talent to complicate things and make them much more convoluted than they really are. Uh, as when you look at the geologic column with all of its zillions of divisions and things, and, and yet you look at the history in Genesis, it's very simple. The creation week, 1656 years to the flood, one year for the flood, and the three, about uh, 4,365 years since the flood. It's very simple, those four periods. So the foundation is in Genesis. So the way Satan and his cohorts work is the three D's of deception, doubt, and denial. So with the deception, Satan deceived Eve. With doubt, was planted in her mind about what God said, yea, did God really say in Genesis 3.1. And then denial. Adam and Eve denied God in his word and disobeyed. So this fits into the overall scheme of history. After the creation uh, week with six days of work and one of rest as the model for us to work six and rest one, we have the Hebrew grammar indicating that those were real 24-hour days because there are these qualifiers, the numbers with the word day and evening and morning, or evening or morning. All of those demand that, that be a 24-hour day. And then again, in the fourth commandment, uh, there is that confirmation of those 24-hour type days. But then we have Satan come along, did God really mean that? So then corruption, the fall in the Garden of Eden. And then, for in that day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And it's, Satan says, did God really say that? You know, doubt, putting doubt in. And then that led to sin becoming so severe that God said, okay, I'm going to wipe man off the face of the earth, literally. And that's what he did with the flood, the Genesis flood, Noah's flood. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills and were under the whole heaven were conquered. So all, whole, everything. The, bless you. There is no... There is no exception here for this to be a local flood. Did God really mean that? Confusion. 106 years after the flood, people had become very, very disobedient again. Didn't take all that long. God had given the command twice in chapter 9 of Genesis to spread out, multiply, fill the entire earth, but they stayed gathered together at Babel and we're building a tower to worship the creation or possibly even fallen angels. And uh, we're not spreading out, so God forced them to spread out by confusing the languages by uh, family groups. And you know, when you can't understand what the other person's saying, you get frustrated. And, and after you talk louder and faster, you finally realize you're getting nowhere and you move on. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So then they finally did after after he forced them to. Okay, so then Christ came in the form of man, uh, incarnation, uh, to live the example for us in perfect obedience to the Father and also to qualify to be that sacrifice on the cross to shed his blood and pay the price for our sins uh, so that he would die in our place and that we could receive forgiveness if we place our faith in him and what he did for us. And then, of course, after that, the resurrection, showing the recreation of life, the eternal life that follows. And then consummation, uh, this is really a pun here, it refers to the end of history, the beginning of eternity future, the consummation bringing it to the point of fulfillment, and also consummation in the sense of burning up, that in Second Peter chapter 3, uh, it's written that the earth and the universe will be burned up, literally, by fire, consumed by fire. And this is necessary because what the flood did was simply bury the evidence of sin. It didn't do away with it. It buried it. And if the planet were allowed to continue on into eternity, then all of those traces of sin would still be 
allowed into eternity and, and God's not going to tolerate that in his presence. So that's why the universe, not just the earth, but the whole universe, because of Romans 8.22, saying that all of the creation was affected by the fall. That's why the whole universe must be burned up to remove all of that so that eternity future will not be contaminated. So we deal with these various types of reinterpretations of scripture by those who want to compromise it to uh, accommodate the evolutionary time frame, saying that the local flood instead of the global flood of uh, Genesis, saying that God used evolution, theistic evolution, uh, which of course compromises his character because he said uh, five times it was good and six and the, the last time very good about creation week and yet if those uh, days are millions of years and the fossil record is interpreted as a record of death and disease, which it is uh, properly, uh, then that's saying that's God calling all that death and disease very good and that impugns his character. The day age business says that each day is a long age. We've dealt with that. Progressive creation is Hugh Ross primarily, but others as well, who say that, that indeed it didn't finish at the beginning of chapter two when, when scripture tells us that creation was completed, but rather that God is still creating through evolution up to the present day. Gap theory says, well, somewhere we need to put these millions and billions of years, so we'll stick it between verses one and two in chapter one of Genesis. And all sorts of funny inventions there which actually fail in their attempt to uh, deal with the history in Genesis. And in the framework hypothesis, t unlike the others, totally does away with any concept of trying to deal with the history in Genesis and simply says that all of these concepts in chapter one of Genesis are just happy, nice thoughts that we maybe kind of, sort of, should have pay a little bit of attention to if we feel like it. So all this stuff is what compromises scripture. So you end up with theological jello that you cannot stand on. No foundation. So here is an example of that. Taking the Bible seriously, but not literally. Okay. Now, sad but true, the way these people look at it. So if a day does not mean a literal day in Genesis, then how do we determine the real meaning? Well, if scientists are to determine it, which ones? And the same holds for Bible commentators, if day does not mean a literal 24-hour day. So the proper study and the principles of language usage are what need to be employed. These are called hermeneutics. This is the proper way of interpreting scripture. You take a look at the language usage. So in this, you, you study the interpretation of the written text, the method of interpreting scripture. You pay attention to context. You don't take something out of context. And so with this business of day, the context here is in Exodus, the context is indeed about creation. It's hearkening back to creation. In Leviticus, the priest shall look on him again the seventh day. Okay, that is a different context. Or here, it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month, second year, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. So again, this is a different context. But all of these, though the number is with the word day, so that means it has to be a 24-hour day. This can't be long age. These cannot be long ages of time. And then Joshua 9:17, the third day, children of Israel journeyed, came into their cities, the third day. So again, it's a different context in creation, but the same laws apply of the number requires that the word day be a 24-hour day, not some long period of time. And so in uh, Genesis, especially, but throughout, Gen throughout Genesis, throughout the Old Testament, but specifically here in chapter one of Genesis, we're talking about these qualifiers that demand it be a 24-hour day. Number, evening, morning, night. It's not some poetic thing, it's history. And remember that in Exodus 20.11, God inscribed with his own finger those <coughs> commandments in the stone. And so we look at chapter 2, 
Verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. All right. Now, this does not have a qualifier here. It doesn't have a number. It doesn't have evening, morning, uh, night. So this is referring to in the time period. This, is, this is, can be, is more than just a day. And then Peter, who, uh, Peter, people who want to say, oh, but each day in creation week is a thousand years to allow a whopping 6,000 years for evolution to happen, go to uh, 2 Peter 3.8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. But we have to remember, this context has nothing to do with creation. It's about God's patience with us, waiting for the number of believers to be completed. And about his not being locked into time, like the way we are. We have great difficulty thinking outside of the box of time. So the second half of the verse simply is the opposite of the first half, and a thousand years as one day. And so this, this is a figure of speech here with the word as there. So this is, this is just making an analogy here, but it's not in the context of creation whatsoever. And so even if it were 6,000 years, so what? That's not even a drop in the bucket that evolution demands. It means millions and billions of years. So that's a totally irrelevant, false way of looking at those things. And again here in Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So here we have confirmation from Christ himself, since he's really talking about himself in the third person. We have these various miracles. So when, when do you stop believing and when uh, stop uh, chopping up Scripture once you deal with uh, terrible treatment of Genesis. You know, where do you stop chopping things up? So you end up saying, well, if it's not six days, then why bother with these miracles? And it's that same hermeneutic, the same study. So always accept the straightforward meaning of the words in a passage of historical narrative. Now, we, there are poetic passages that are not to be taken literally, but it's clear from how it is written which is historical and which is poetic. So those creation days are literal 24-hour days. And a way to establish this is the study of the verb tense. The preterite is the simple past. I walked, she ran, they talked, you wrote, we ate. Very simple, one time, completed, non-repetitive, non-habitual action. That is what is used to record history. And the technical word for this is the preterite. Then we have these other uh, tenses, whether they be in the past, present, or future, that deal with incomplete action or action is repeated, action that is habitual, ongoing. So all of those in contrast to the preterite, the simple past, one time completed, one and done action. So... Um, Professor James Boyd at uh, Masters University in, in California, a Hebrew scholar, went through and he selected passages that everybody agrees are historical narrative. No question. He selected passages that everybody agrees are poetic. No question, no controversy, no argument. And then he looked at the usage of the verbs in those two categories, and in the, the historical narrative, as denoted here by the uh, green uh, markers there, the green diamonds, uh, that's the percentage of the simple past, preterite, the tense, the preterite tense, a simple one time, one and done, finished action. And notice that with only one exception, that all of those uh, have 25% or higher percentage of that preterite tense. Then from the poetic passages, with only one exception, they're all below 20% of the preterite tense. So there's a very clear demarcation as to what passages are historical narrative and what passages are poetic. There's no confusion here. And when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it has 65% of the preterite. So this is clearly, clearly historical narrative, not poetic. It's very straightforward. 
And so we are to take that history given to us and with its absolute truth, use that as the foundation for how we think. So we are here to influence non-believers, not for them to influence us. And that's what's going on in a great extent, in and outside of the church. That's why so much of the church is indistinguishable from the world and is so weak, impotent. So what evidence has God given us about his creation? Well, he's given us his word, number one, and he's given us design and complexity. So here you see a diagrammatic representation of a cell and also of a short segment of DNA. Well, from Romans 1, 19 and 20, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, in them, in us, for God has shown it to them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, by what we can observe, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <coughs> this ver verse came to life for me when I was down in uh, Brazil and had the uh, <coughs> great opportunity to listen to the account of a, a episode that a missionary couple had. They were both trained in linguistics, not learning a particular language, but learning the laws of languages. That's what linguistics is. And they had their degrees in that, and so they were missionaries, and they were assigned to a, a tribe that lived way up in the headwaters of the Amazon, very western part of Brazil, uh, up toward the Andes Mountains. A tribe of just a few hundred people, no one had any clue what that language was like. Uh, nobody could communicate or talk with them. So their job was to go there, learn the language, and then, then to be able to get the foundation for the uh, grammar and the vocabulary to be able to translate the uh, New Testament for those people into their, into their language. And so they lived with them for two years, uh, purposely only focusing on learning the language and establishing relationships, uh, saying nothing about uh, scripture and their belief. And after two years, they had developed a really good uh, ability to communicate. And a young man in the tribe came to them and stunned them when he asked them the question, what is the name of the man who died for my sins? And they had done zero preaching. Well, it's because this verse, as it says in this verse, he had seen in nature that there had to be a creator and in his heart he wanted to be right in that relationship with that creator. And so the Holy Spirit honored his desire and let him know that since he wanted to honor God that his sins had been taken care of. So he wanted to know the name of the man who died for him so he could thank him. <laughs> and this is not an isolated incident either. This has occurred many times around the world. So that really brought this to life for me, uh, hearing this firsthand from these uh, missionaries who had, who had experienced that. Well, we have the witness of far greater detail, not just what we can see with our eyes, but what we can see with microscopes and with other very sophisticated tools to understand biology now down to the very molecular level. Uh, and so uh, it just screams creation. There's just no way this stuff could have come about by random chance accidental events. So just to give you a little taste of this, human body contains approximately 50 to 75 trillion cells. And those are my three offspring, climbing rocks, uh, doing gymnastics, and flying over the bar there uh, when they were in school. And uh, it's, am it's amazing the stuff that the human body can do. We have some 220 distinct cell types. Uh, there's dispute about the exact number, but it's in that ballpark. Just to give you an example, we have, uh, this is uh, muscle, you can see it's striped, it's called striated muscle, this is your skeletal muscle, this is what you make a decision to move, to do something, skeletal muscle. This is smooth muscle, it's spindle shaped, and these are the muscles that do things like contract your blood vessels or open or close your airways or move things along in your gut. Okay, you don't control those, those are on automatic 
uh, modes of operating. The system runs itself. And then here we have cardiac muscle, heart muscle, which is different than the other two. And this is uh, specialized for conducting electrical currents through the heart so that it all contracts together in a coordinated fashion for each beat that pumps the blood through your uh, arteries and your whole system. Uh, we have these kinds of cells here. These are very flat cells that uh, line, uh, for example, our mouth uh, so that they, when they encounter friction from the food we eat, they can slough off and be replaced readily by the next layer underneath. Uh, nerve cells here, which are not replaceable, uh, extremely complex uh, cells with ability to interact with other cells. And so our brain has got these zillions of cells with zillions of con uh, connections between the cells uh, sharing information. The red blood cells specialize in carrying oxygen. Uh, these are bone cells uh, in special arrangements, uh, arranged in these circular patterns, kind of like rebar in concrete to make the bones even stronger. And then here we have the pancreas with certain cells to make uh, hormones which are put into the, uh, the blood, for example, insulin. Uh, and then other cells uh, that make the digestive enzymes that don't go into the blood, they go into ducts to go into the gut to help you digest your food in the gut. All of this is phenomenally complex. And this is just a tiny taste of what's going on in your bodies. Within the cell, we have these uh, organelles, in other words, small structures within a cell that deal with taking in the fuel, the sugar, and producing energy molecules that can be used to drive other reactions in the cell. Uh, guards against invasion. We have transport systems. It acts kind of like the UPS system. We have the food factories. Uh, Export factories, sell, uh, products are made to be exported out to other parts of the body. Barriers, uh, for example, you know, the skin, mucous membranes, uh, tears, secretions to uh, protect us from invasion by bacteria. Disposal and uh, recycling systems. All this stuff, communication in the inside and outside the cell city, the molecular machines that manufacture their own replacement parts. This is so oversimplified, <laughs> I can hardly stand it. <laughs> uh, just one molecular machine, one protein, for example, is made up of 964 amino acids, and each of those have multiple, multiple atoms. 302 lipid, or uh, you could say fat molecules, over 12,000 water molecules, and over 112,000 atoms in just one molecular machine. And we have thousands of different kinds of these molecular machines. Okay, well the atoms themselves have electrons which are outside of the nucleus and the neutrons and protons in the nucleus and how they interact with each other. My students I see here are having a fun time learning about in goriest of detail in our organic chemistry class. Quarks that make up the neutrons and the protons. So these are even the, the particles that are smaller than the neutrons and the protons. So there's phenomenal complexity in all of this stuff. There is no way that any of this stuff could come about by random chance events. It all has to be just the way it is. It's Goldilocks. It's Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold. It has to be just right. Well, machines all have different functions. And so we see examples of these different kinds of machines here. Well, we have these molecular machines in our body. Well, how did these machines you see pictured here come about? Did they just randomly assemble themselves? No, they had to be designed, which means there had to be a designer. A designer. Well, same thing with the machines in our body. Well, DNA is the software of life. It contains the information for the designs that was put there by the designer. It's the storehouse of the information. It's a library of information inside the cell. Uh, Dr. John Sanford is a Christian who is a geneticist. Uh, he's had many fine accomplishments in the uh, published uh, scientific literature. 
And a quote of his, there is no information system designed by man that can even begin to compare to DNA. Okay, for example, DNA is five billion times more compact than a 500 gigabyte drive. Five billion times more compact. And it replicates itself <laughs> with the help of the mode of the uh, machines, the proteins. And so you have to have the machines and you have to have the DNA. You have to have all of it together. You can't have part of it evolving until the rest of it gets there. So it's a very compact code. On the two by two uh, microscope slide, there's enough information to fill 7.7 .7 trillion Bibles. You stack those Bibles up and they would go past the earth, from the earth past the sun. Stack them up. That's that much information in the cell. This should be mind blowing to you. Okay, here is a quote from a secular scientist. A billion universes, each populated by billions of typing monkeys, could not type out a single gene, a single gene of this genome. And we have some 20,000 plus genes. Okay. Cell is far more complex than any man-made machine or even the largest metropolis. So this harkens back to Romans 1.19.20 clearly seen, the evidence we have in front of us, clearly seen, indicates God's power and divine nature. So here are letters representing the four bases, the four letters in the code that DNA uses, and also in RNA. RNA is, among other things, the messenger taking the information from the DNA to the factory and the rest of the cell. So this is what specifies the sequence of the amino acids to build the proteins. You have to put the amino acids in the exact correct order in order to get the proper protein produced. Part of this code determines where these proteins are going to go, where they are needed. Also determines the speed of producing the messenger, the RNA messenger that goes to the factory, take the information from the nucleus to the factory out in the cell and how fast that's going to happen. And the speed that the protein production actually occurs. All of this in the same stretch of DNA. So we have overlapping codes in the very same stretch. So it's not just one simple code. We have at least four different codes in the very same stretch of DNA. Now try and tell me how that came about by random chance events. Werner Gitt, who is the director of Germany's uh, prime uh, premier uh, physics institute, there is no known law of nature, no known process, no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Okay, in other words, matter cannot give rise to information. It, we use matter to store information, whether it be chalk on board, ink on paper, electrons in computer, chiseling in stone, but matter cannot give rise to information. It's only used to store the information. So since the density and complexity of information encoded in DNA far exceeds anything that we can come up with, we can conclude that neither random chance nor any human being could qualify as the originator. So we must therefore we have to look to an all-powerful, all-knowing creator who came up with not only information, but the machines to use that information to cause the processes that are necessary to happen. So is the book of Genesis relevant in America today? Absolutely. In the first three chapters, actually the first 11, but especially the first three chapters, we have this, this solid foundation, our original relationship with God, why we have death and as a result of sin, as a result of the disobedience in chapter 3 of Genesis in the garden, 
why we need a savior to rescue us from this sinful condition that we are in. And why God will make everything new. So we can't deal with this cut and paste theology where the scripture gets chewed up and you select what's cherry pick, what's, you know, nice that you want to hold on to and discard the rest. You have to have the whole thing because all of the rest of the book rests on those earliest chapters of Genesis. It all begins there. So the biblical worldview and the foundation for Christian doctrines in those 11 chapters there. So we have the origin of space, time, and matter, as I've explained in verse 1-1 of Genesis. The definition of marriage, one man with one woman, no other variations in the sanctity of marriage. Why there are thorns and thistles, and of course that represents all sorts of problems that we have in the world because of the fall. Why we have death and suffering. Again, as a result of man's disobedience, the common question is, if God is so good, then why do we have all this rottenness in the world? You know, well, he didn't create the rottenness. The rottenness is as a result of our disobedience. Why Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross to pay that penalty for us to die in our place to redeem us from our sinful condition, to satisfy the sense of justice of the Father. And why God will have to make everything new, which I explained earlier, because nothing from this current universe will be allowed into eternity future so that there are no traces of sin in that eternity future. And why Earth's surface looks the way it does, totally remodeled from what it was from creation because of the worldwide total global nature of Noah's flood, judging sin at that time. And why we have different people groups and different languages because again of the judgment at Babel, kicking people in the rear to get them to obey and spread out and fill the earth and populate it. So they wouldn't stick together because they couldn't understand each other. So Jesus is called the last Adam because he's the one who solves the problem of the first Adam. And this emphasizes that he is our kinsman redeemer, that he, since he's related to us, he can buy us out of our quandary by paying the price for us. So is the book of Genesis relevant today in America? Absolutely. So we learn about the character of God in these chapters. He is all-powerful, only he can create matter and energy out of nothing. He is the God of order, and all th in him all things consist. And this was what sets Christianity, uh, the, uh, as well as uh, Judaism and uh, the Muslim faith, apart from the all other religions is he's the God. He makes our attention uh, focus. He is the God of order, not disorder. All these pagan religions uh, deal with disorder and all these multitude of gods and they're fighting each other. And, and, but no, he is the God of order. He is transcendent. He is above all. He created all. And he is the sovereign, absolute rule of his creation. And we have to realize that we actually, not only do our things, our stuff belong to him, but our bodies belong to him. Everything belongs to him. Because we were all created by him. And so we are to be good stewards of what we're given, good stewards of our bodies and of everything gives us and to live a righteous way. He has a special interest in us. We are the apex of his creation. As I mentioned, all other gods are false gods and he is the perfect God. He is the God of judgment because of his righteousness. He said, this is good, this is bad. Don't do what's bad. If you do, then something happens. And he kept his promise. He does not lie. But he also is the God of mercy, grace, and love. And that's what Christ is all about, is 
since he is love, mercy was granted, grace extended, and love shown by his death on the cross to pay the price for our sins. So that concludes the talk. I'll finish us up with a prayer and then turn it back over. So Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share your truth. Just pray that it penetrates hearts and that uh, this information uh, given will be used by folks here to reach other folks who don't yet know you or who are confused about who you really are, Lord, so that they can have crystal clear understanding and come to faith in you. So thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for everyone here, and that we would all serve you and that you get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give Dr. Gazelle a hand. Thank you, Dr. Gazelle. Dr. Gazelle will be uh, available at the back table back here in the back if you've got any questions for him, um, uh, anything you'd like to share with him or get some insight on. He'll be glad to help you with that. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. How many of you guys believe that this morning? Amen. You were made by God, and so you are a special design. And as we just saw in this uh, presentation, this teaching time, uh, it should give you a greater awe of God. It's like, man, wow, God has designed an incredible machine, and he's put his DNA and his code in me. And so it is wonderful. And so I hope that you will leave here today not just with information, but you'll leave here today with transformation. Uh, the Bible says that to be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I hope today God has done that in your heart and in your mind today. Uh, just a couple of announcements as we dismiss. Um, you can find my notes. But number one is uh, the backpacks. I think we've collected all the backpacks um, uh, back here. Let's give God the glory for that. Amen. Um, so I had 30 backpacks, and I think it's like I started adding up how much everybody invested in the backpacks, like close to $1,000 that is uh, going to be given to the boys at uh, the Ram Ministry. And uh, so they're going to be receiving that for Christmas. So uh, that's just a praise to the Lord. Uh, also, too, are the Ingles in the house today? Where are they? There they are. I don't have my glasses on. We have the Ingles back uh, with us today from Costa Rica. And uh, they're in transition. They're going to be going to northern Arizona uh, for a ministry up there. And uh, you guys connect with them after the service. They can tell you all about it, maybe how maybe you can help support that as well. Um, also, hey, this coming Tuesday night, uh, College and Career Night uh, at 7 p.m. right here in the warehouse. So uh, if you'd like to get involved with that, see Pastor Jeff Orr and also Tabitha, if you see her, uh, they can connect you with that. And then also uh, tomorrow night, we're resuming our For His Glory class, which is uh, teaching on doctrine and theology right here in the warehouse at 6.30 p.m. So uh, we're going to finish out the semester over the next three Mondays. Hope you can be part of that as well. You guys have a blessed, blessed week. So glad to see you. Glad that you're here. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.